First of all, stage number one is rejection by God. Rejection by God. It opens with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry to you by day, but you don't answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Quoted both by Matthew and Mark as the words of Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? First of all, this cry is very emotional. It is an emotional cry. And some commentators have said that it was only the way Jesus felt that he was not forsaken by God. But I like the words of the theologian John Calvin who said that it was necessary that Jesus not only bear the pain and the judgment in his body, but also in his soul, and that there was a forsaking by the Father of Jesus on the cross when he became a sin offering. It's an emotional cry, but it's a perplexing cry. Why would the Father forsake the Son, the Son whom he loves? You know, of course, that oftentimes when we preach the gospel, we give the impression that God the Father is very angry. He has inflexible holiness, which is true. But we give the impression that the Son is loving, and so the Son appeased the anger of God. May I remind you that the work on the cross was the work of the Trinity. As a matter of fact, what we find is that there was an agreement in eternity past, the Bible says, in eternity past, an agreement between the Father and the Son that the Son would become the sacrifice, yes, to take care of the justice of God and to release the love of God, but also that the Father would be in agreement. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the will of the Father and the will of the Son were one and the same. They coincided. Because you see, what happened at the cross, there had to be two attributes of God that were resolved. Love wanted to redeem humanity. Justice said you can't because they're sinners. So what happened on the cross is that when Jesus Christ paid our debt and said it is finished, what happened on the cross is that Jesus paid the debt. The justice side has been taken care of, and now love can be lavished upon us without measure and that which is even beyond our understanding. So we need to get that clear. The Father is also a redeeming God. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. So it is, however, a perplexing cry. We should not for a moment believe that there was a break in the Trinity. That's not even possible. The essence of God, the ontological nature of God, I have so few opportunities to use that word, I like to throw it in when it fits. <laughs> the ontological nature of God, his very essence remained a trinity without any break. What we're talking about is, is a break in fellowship, not a break in relationship in terms of essence. But it was also a hopeful cry when Jesus was there on the cross. You'll notice it says in verse 3, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted in you, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and they were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. So amid the cry, there is also hope. There was, however, this rejection of God. The fellowship was broken. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, as the psalm continues, what we discover is that there was the ridicule of men. The ridicule of men. I'm picking it up in verse 6. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. <laughs> he trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Of course, this was fulfilled at the cross. The Bible says that when Jesus was dying there on the cross, the people who walked by and saw him ridiculed him. 
And then all of us know that there was one of the thieves that was crucified with him who said, if you're the son of God, save yourself and us. He had no idea what he was asking. If Jesus had come down from the cross and saved his life and then saved the life of that companion, that thief, what would he have accomplished? A few more years of earthly existence. When Jesus was dying there, if he had come down from the cross, you and I would have been left unredeemed. But he mocked him because he was looking at only what his eyes could see and only the moments of time. And so he mocked Jesus. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. When you and I become followers of Jesus, we can expect some mocking too. We live in a world and in a church that wants no mocking at all. Any kind of a stand that we take in our culture is dismissed as being, oh, you're just a right-wing fanatic or you're a religious fanatic. And who are you to say that two people who love each other can't be married? And oftentimes we don't have an answer. The fact is simply this, that Jesus also was mocked and he was ridiculed by those who walked by. And the Bible goes on to say that they pierced him. Now, if you're following along in my Bible, at least, I have to turn a page. And uh, one of the things that we learned just before we turn a page, I learned a new word this week, zoomorphism. Have you ever heard of zoomorphism? Zoomorphism is to take the characteristics of an animal and apply it to human beings. And that's what happens in this psalm. It says in verse 12, many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me, they open wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. Get him, kill him, and take care of him. Put an end to his ideas and what he teaches, and put an end to him, good riddance. So Jesus here is dying, and where are his friends? Well, you know, the disciples basically forsook him and fled, even though John, to his everlasting credit, did come back to the cross, as indicated in the book of John. But Jesus basically is dying alone and saying, as he did in the garden, can't you watch with me for an hour? And they kept falling asleep. What happens when you ask your friends to pray, your friends to be there, and they aren't? Jesus is dying alone forsaken by God, ridiculed by men. But now notice in the text there's a marvelous prediction that could never have been written down by David if this were not an inspired psalm, as all the psalms are. You'll notice that the text says in verse 16, another zoomorphism, for dogs encompassed me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Wow. In Jewish literature and in the Jewish customs of the time, nobody was crucified. As far as execution of the Jews in their time was concerned, it was always stoning. Here you have a prediction of the crucifixion of Jesus which would be done by Romans many centuries after the time of David. They pierced my hands and they pierced my feet. We're talking about the nails that nailed him to the cross. And in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it says that someday the Jewish nation shall look on him whom they have pierced and shall mourn for him. And what does the scripture say in Revelation chapters 1, 7, and 8? Behold, he comes in the clouds, and every eye will see him, and they also which pierced him. And the tribes of the earth shall mourn because of him. What you have is Jesus dying on the cross, being crucified. They pierced my hands and my feet, and they thought to themselves they were getting rid of Jesus. So far we've seen the rejection of God, the break in fellowship, We've seen the ridicule of people, but there's also now a prayer for deliverance in verse 19, a prayer for deliverance. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly in my aid, to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. 
Save me from the mouth of the lion. You rescued me from the horns of wild oxen. Wow. Did you know verse 21, according to commentators who know Hebrew much better than I do, that that is really a tense, a past perfect, which indicates that Jesus was heard and he was delivered. Have you ever asked yourself the question as to whether or not God answered the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane? Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Was he answered or not? Well, he did have to go through the cross. But you know what the Bible says in, book, in the book of Hebrews? It says that Jesus cried up with long suffering, long crying and tears unto him that was able to deliver him from death and was heard in that he feared. The Greek indicates that he got an answer to his prayer. And the answer, of course, was the resurrection. And so Jesus here in agony is praying, and he doesn't see the answer immediately. He must go through the torture of the cross. But in the end, God answers and delivers him. And he is raised from the dead, and days later, he goes to heaven completely triumphant, knowing that all of his prayers ultimately have been answered. And also there's a prayer here of hope for others. You know, it says in verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And you who fear the Lord yet praise him and so forth, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. That's verse 24. Did you notice that quote? I will speak your name to the brothers. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it's quoted. And the Bible says there that because of the fact that God is the father of Jesus and God is our father, since we have the same father, we are brothers and we are sisters. And it says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus now proclaims the name of God to us and is not ashamed to be called our brothers. Are you ashamed of Jesus? When you go to work tomorrow, do you witness to the person next to you in that cubicle? Do you share your faith with your neighbors or you don't want to be considered weird and you're a little bit ashamed of the gospel? Well, I want you to know that Jesus isn't ashamed of us. Why should we be ashamed of him who redeemed us and loved us? May it never be said that we are ashamed of the only message that is able to transform hearts. Let us stand for Jesus wherever he has planted us and do so with joy and no shame. Jesus is therefore the one who is going to proclaim the name of God to all of us. When we get to the end of the psalm now, we see the triumph of Jesus, don't we? The Bible says, for example, in verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. During this month, we are emphasizing missions, outreach to the world. And we say to ourselves, we seem to be failing so much because there are so many countries where the percentage of believers is so small. Well, that may be true, and this may be a millennial passage, but in the end, the missionary enterprise will win because Jesus is going to still be proclaimed over all the earth and all the families of the nations, verse 27, shall worship before you. Why? Verse 28, the kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. He rules over the nations now, but he does it through all of his agencies, through all of his leaders, and he's letting the world do its own thing, waiting until his enemies become a footstool for his feet. No matter what you see when you look around today, and it can become very discouraging, will you remember that in the end, as I emphasized last week, Jesus always wins, triumphant as Lord of lords and God of all gods. Well, this, uh, these times since our anniversary, we're talking about legacy, aren't we? You'll notice that the Bible says in verse 30, posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generations. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people not yet 
born. And this, that he has done it, that he has done it. I'm going to be speaking about the unborn when I speak about legacy in a different context. Well, we've hurried through this marvelous psalm, and I promised you that we deal with the big issues of life, such as life and death and fears. How are we going to do that? Let, give, let me give you three transforming applications that I hope you'll take the time to write down. One or two of them are a bit long, but I'll give you plenty of time so that you can record them. Number one, I'd say simply this, cries of distress. Cries of distress are not always cries of distrust. Cries of distress are not always cries of distrust. In his distrust, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There are seven cries from the cross. That happens to be the middle one. It's number four, three on each side. This is the only time in prayer that Jesus ever referred to God as God. He always said, my father. So when he prayed, he always said, my father. This time, because the fellowship is broken, and he feels the despair of that broken fellowship, he cries out and says, my God, but notice he says, my God, my God. He still knows that God belongs to him. And then there are two more sayings from the cross, and when we get to the very last one, what does Jesus say just before he surrenders his spirit? And he surrendered his spirit because he was still king on the cross. He says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. The father-son relationship is back. He was in the hands of men the first three hours on the cross, and then he was in the hands of God becoming a sin offering, and all of that despair and darkness over the land so that no human eye could possibly know what was going on during that time because that was only between the Father and the Son. You and I can't understand it. So the sky becomes black and dark while the sin offering was being offered in our place. God does not promise us a smooth journey in life. What he does promise us is a safe landing. The journey for Jesus was difficult, excruciating, and agonizing. But in the end, he dies in the hands of his father. He was committed to the hands of evil men, the Bible says, and evil men nailed him to the cross. But there comes a time when evil hands can only do so much and the divine hands take over. And Jesus dies, it says, into thy hands I commit my spirit. A cry of distress does not necessarily mean a cry of distrust. I had a friend who died of cancer. I used to play tennis with him. And this week as I was reading these verses, I thought of him because he said that he was in this room with his wife. He was sleeping and he was in such pain and such agony. He said he left the bedroom, didn't want to wake his wife, sat on the couch. And he said, all faith drained from my soul. There was nothing left except to cry up to God, but that cry of distress was not a cry of distrust. He could say as Jesus on the cross, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws and you lay me in the dust of death. That's verses. 14 and 15 in the text. Distress, but he's still my God. And in the end, Father. And when you and I die, we have to be able to look up and say, Father, to thy hands I commit my spirit. Safe landing. There's a second lesson, and that is simply this, that um, Jesus got what he didn't deserve. And you've heard me say this before. Jesus got what he didn't deserve so that you and I could get what we don't deserve. 
Jesus got what we don't deserve, excuse, what he didn't deserve, so that we could get what we don't deserve. He didn't deserve to die. What is this holy man doing on the cross? The faultless, holy, sinless Son of God. Tell me, what is he doing there? And having to cry up, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, the answer, of course, is that he was dying in our place. And the Bible says that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Many of you might know that uh, one of the men I've had some acquaintance with as I've studied his writings is Martin Luther. And Luther uh, agonized. He had what is known in German as Anfechtungen. It's no good English translation. It means the existential despair of soul. It means distress. It means depression. Luther fought depression all of his life. But the question was, how can I please God? And he did everything. You know his story. He did everything he possibly could. He fasted. He slept on a floor without blankets. And Rebecca and I have been to the monastery where he lived, and we've seen what he slept on, basically a stone floor. Why? Trying to mortify the flesh. But what if God's standard is still higher than all that? He was led to despair. In about 14, excuse me, 1514, he began to lecture on the Psalms in Wittenberg, and he got to this passage. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a reference to Jesus on the cross. Why is he also overtaken by Anfechtungen, this sense of despair and alienation and separation from God? A little bit of light came to his soul, and he began to realize that he wasn't doing this because of himself. He was doing this for me. He was being rejected so that I would never have to be rejected. He was purchasing my salvation and taking my place on the cross. And then when Luther got to the book of Romans, it is then that he saw with clarity what this was all about. And he realized that there's two kinds of righteousness. There's a righteousness that belongs to God as an attribute, but there's also righteousness given to sinners as a gift. And Jesus became sin for us and got what he didn't deserve so that we could get what we don't deserve, namely the gift of his awesome, perfect righteousness that is given to sinners, just like you and me. And that's why there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The condemnation was taken by Jesus. It is true that we sometimes are out of fellowship with God and we have to confess our sins to get back into fellowship. But for those who believe there is no condemnation because we receive God's approval, his blessing, as if we were Jesus. And when you die, you'll be welcomed into heaven as if you are Jesus because after all, you are his brother or his sister and you'll be welcomed in holy and totally accepted by a holy God whose inflexible holiness is so high that you and I cannot comprehend it, much less as sinners even attempt to attain to it. That is the gospel, and the gospel is found here in Psalm 22. There's something else, and it's the bottom line here that I'm sharing with you today, and that is that uh, the mission of Jesus was successful. Jesus was successful in what he undertook. He died for sinners, the just for the unjust, and God accepted that sacrifice as indicated, as indicated in the resurrection, that God was totally pleased with what Jesus did. And when Jesus said to Telestai, paid in full, he purchased that redemption. And we can list our sins on one side and the grace of God and the death of Jesus on the other. And we can say, paid in full. Immorality, paid in full. Wow. Dishonesty, paid in full. And abortion, paid in full all paid in full. The issue is not the greatness of your sin. 
I speak to those of you who are criminals, done horrendous things that I would never even mention from this pulpit. You too come to a Savior, and when you trust him, that sin too is paid in full. That is redemption. And in the end, the triumph of Jesus. All nations shall eventually worship, everybody confessing that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father, totally triumphant. And when you see him there on the cross, that was the gateway for him to redeem us, to retain his deity and kingship. And yet at the same time, that God might be a redeeming God. Yesterday afternoon, my afternoon was cut a little bit short because there was someone who was to be speaking here in the area whose plane was delayed. And as a result of that, I uh, left this message without a closing illustration. I got up this morning and wondered, uh, what illustration should I use? And then I was coming in today, and I think I heard this on a radio station here by the name of WMBI. Have any of you heard of WMBI? You ought to listen once in a while. By the way, there's some good teaching programs on <laughs> WMBI. And there was a story about two missionaries who were in a jungle, and one of them was bit by a snake. And um, they went to the compound, because at the compound there was a, a kit that said, you know, this kit is for snake bites, various medicines and things that you have to do if you have a snake bite. So they went there, they found the kit, and they opened it, and it was empty. Now, thankfully, they were able to take the person who had a need to the hospital, and she lived. But here's the point. You and I have all been bitten by a snake bite. We are all sinners who cannot attain to the righteousness of God. And, you know, you're looking for an answer like Luther was, and, and you go to other religions, and you open up the kit, and it can, it's empty. I want to tell you, it is empty. Because all that they can do is to tell you to do better. Sin a little more or a little less, but do better. It's about all they can do. And uh, you go in, and you empty it, and you say, you look at it, and you say, well, you know, money is the answer, or sexuality or whatever, pleasure is the answer. And what you will find is that kit is empty. But when you come to Jesus, you discover that the kit has a remedy for sin. And the only one who has a remedy for sin is the one who died for sinners, that you and I might be redeemed. Trust him today. Believe him today. You who are skeptical, you come to him with your doubts. You who are fearful, know that he has taken care of our most important fears because he took a path that you and I will someday take, and it will end with, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. I love Jesus. Do you love him? Anybody out there? Let's pray in his name. Father, we ask that these words shall fall upon ears that have been listening. And for those, Father, through going through that existential despair, not knowing what to do with their sin or their predicament, we pray today that they might see at the cross the answer to their need. Thank you for thinking of us. Thank you for including us in the death of Jesus, that we might be redeemed. And thank you, Father, we can give this message to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.